Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you in the cut content series for Vanilla World of Warcraft. Today we continue to explore the long lost alpha client and all of the weird features and areas that failed to make the cut, starting off with the lost islands. So to the west of Westfall, we find a couple of islands that never made it into the game, first covering the northernmost Gilligems. This is most definitely a reference to the 70s TV sitcom Gilligan's Island where after a storm, a ship set ground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle, and the island itself is actually quite massive. Judging from the map, it's about the size of Deadwind Pass. I'll give you a pretty thorough tour here, starting on the docks on the southern end of the island. You'll notice a lot of the environment and architecture is quite similar to Stranglethorn, which makes sense because it's not too far from here. And going up the hill, we have this little cave and camp area with a giant turkey being spit-roasted. This leads to a fork in the road where you can go straight or up. Going up leads to another small camp with a tent. I imagine that this would have been a little quest hub area like that rebel camp in Stranglethorn or something. But heading back down and following the path straight leads to another fork where you can either go forward or check out the beach. Going to the beach first, we have some of those turtle skeletons that you would find in Darkshore. And it goes on for a little while until you can see some ruins to the right. And going through here, we actually have a few different ways to go. There's another beach, there's a bridge leading to some more ruins, or a side path. Following the side path, there's another fork. Going straight leads you back to where we started, and going across the bridge leads you to the northern part of the island. To the left is a small cliff area with not a whole lot going on, but if you were to go right, we have this happy little waterfall, and interestingly enough, an actual NPC, which is kind of rare for unfinished areas. It's a naked human in sort of a locked pose. You can't interact with them, unfortunately, but clearly there were some plans for a little questing area here of some sort. If you notice, there's also some random paths strewn about, so it's a pretty early work in progress. But heading back across the bridge, let's go check out the ruins that we walked by. The bridge is actually broken and requires a jump, and you're met with three more paths. One is just a single room cave, which is of course empty, and going down the stairs it splits off into more stairs leading nowhere, a shore to the river that separates the two islands, and a small cave system. Who knows what it would have held, but if I remember correctly, these were most typically used for ogre caves. You have that ogre mound in Duskwood, and also in Altarak, and considering that there is an ogre presence in Stranglethorn, maybe they also had a little island here as well. I mean, that was a pretty big turkey back there. Heading out though, and going up the hill to the right, exiting the cave, we have another creepy NPC just hanging out, and behind him, a wrecked ship. Probably a reference again to the Gilligan's Isle sitcom. This is where they would have crash landed maybe, and maybe this guy is Gilligan or Skipper or whatever. You know, everybody's like Ginger or Marianne. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here like, what about Mrs. Howell? Oh, Thurston! Like I said, this is the smaller of the two islands, so let's go north and check out the island of Dr. Lepidus. But before that, let's talk about today's sponsor, Boo.dev. Boo.dev isn't like them other coding platforms. They've cracked the code <laughs> on how to make learning backend development not just effective, but also fun. They've designed the entire experience like an RPG game where you're not just passively watching tutorials, but you're actively completing quests, earning XP, leveling up, and even taking on boss fights. I've worked with them in the past because considering the subject matter, I think it resonates really well with you guys. It's very RPG-like and you can learn Python and Go while feeling like you're actually playing an RPG. I used to have a background in computer science myself and I have actually been using it as more of just a hobby and I'm really enjoying it so far. It feels like a new way to learn without the boredom that usually comes with these online courses. It gets you writing a ton of code because that's really the only way you can learn. Plus you have a very supportive Discord community and even an AI powered bear wizard named the Boots who will guide you through any tricky concepts. If you're apprehensive, they do offer a 30 day no questions asked refund policy. So if it's not for you, no worries. Plus you can also demo every course for free to see if it clicks with your learning style. I would say that if you have been on the fence about doing something like this, this would be a really good way to kind of get your feet wet to see if it would be something that is for you. If you would like to try it, 
click the link in the description and use my code mad season show to get 25% off your first payment whether it's for one month or an entire year <clears throat> starting from the eastern beach you'll see that it's mostly empty plains until you reach a fork where you can go straight to some ruins or right up a hill and going right first is a traversable yet fairly empty area with not really a whole lot going on but going back and going to the ruins and going across the bridge you'll find it's pretty intricate I'd say that it's approximately maybe half the size of Zulgarub, and instead of narrating it all, I figured I would just show you here because it is quite a big area and there are a ton of nooks and crannies to explore. There definitely was a lot of work put into this area. Exiting the ruins, we have this glitched bridge that phases into the ground. And following that, we have a pretty open area with a little cave and two directions, a beach or further into the jungle. Going to the beach, you'll find more ruins scattered about. And here it's also we find evidence of quest hubs potentially with camps and equipment strewn about. So maybe you were to land on this western end of the island via boat from Booty Bay or something. These islands are in fatigue waters, so you weren't meant to swim to them. And non-continental boat travel is, of course, established, like in Fearless for the Alliance, for example. Before heading back and further into the jungle, if you followed the dry river south, you would have found another one of those small cave systems. Of course, it's empty like everything else here. And finally, going deeper into the jungle near that smaller cave and heading north, you'll see just how much work was put into this area with all the foliage. If I were to show you a random screenshot, you'd probably guess that this is Stranglethorn Vale. You'll soon come to another split in the road where you can go left or right. Going right leads to a little compound with houses and a sawmill and a giant berry popsicle that the locals worship. Nah, just kidding. This is one of those binding stones that we discussed in a previous episode. For some reason it's just untextured here, but there would have eventually been an NPC to bind you here where you would res every time you died. And as for the compound, it's pretty reminiscent of the Curzon area in Northeast Stranglethorn actually. It uses a lot of the same assets and buildings and whatnot. It also has that abandoned inn from Moonbrook and 
some really messed up docks, and also an oil platform that doesn't have any collision. So considering the docks, maybe this is actually where you would have landed to start the island. But heading back to the fork and going left this time, we have another split. Going right leads to one of those big mage towers. I wonder if maybe this is where Dr. Lapidus resided. Maybe he was the big bad of the area to serve as the finale or something. But going the other way, we reach a dead end with this little tannery thing to mark that it's a work in progress. So it's 2003. It's 2 a.m. at Blizzard headquarters. Some developer ran out of breast milk and said, screw this crap, I'll finish it later. But the later never came. I don't know, maybe he got fired for cube crawling or something. But that's pretty much it. There is more landmass beyond this point, but since you're obviously not meant to reach it yet, it's all very barren. Sort of like those out of bounds areas that you would find all over the Eastern Kingdoms in Kalimdor. But these are two pretty huge landmasses that had a decent amount of work put into them for them to never see the light of day. Stranglethorn is level 30 to 40 ish, but you kind of need to supplement it with other areas like Desolus, which is across the world. So maybe that's a result of them just running out of time and cutting these places out. I could definitely see these areas being done alongside Stranglethorn, or maybe they were even meant to be high level elite areas like Tyr's Hand in the Eastern Plague Lands, for example. But pretty cool and interesting nonetheless that even after 20 years, there's still stuff that. I've never seen in this game, I'm not sure about you guys. Next, doing another class here. Priest was pretty different in its original inception, uh, specifically Discipline. They were more inspired from Dungeons and Dragons because they had a melee component to them. This was largely abandoned by release, but there was some evidence still lingering about, such as in 1.0, their inner fire spell increasing melee attack power, which just mystified players back then. Although this was eventually removed, the chaplains in the Scarlet Monastery dungeon still retained it. So this is what a melee priest would have looked like. Aside from that, there are also various cloth items in the game that have like strength and agility on them, which most just chalked up to weird itemization. But in reality, it was tailored <laughs> for the cloth melee class. But aside from all that, in the alpha, they also had some interesting stuff going on, such as the ability to sleep any target. As you may know, this was eventually given to druids in the form of hibernate, but only for beasts and dragonkin. You're probably familiar with their power word spells. At this time, they were called holy word, which functioned the same except for shield, which had a different graphic. And it also didn't give you the weakened soul debuff, which combined with its short cooldown made it incredibly overpowered. In vanilla, there only ended up being one shadow word, and that was pain, which was a dot, which is the same in the alpha but they had a couple of others at this point. There was Befuddle, which slowed casting speed, and also Fumble, which reduced the target's chance to hit by 75% for 10 seconds on a one minute cooldown. Mind Control was called Dominate. Abolished Disease was Nullified Disease, which also granted immunity for a short time. Resurrection was usable in combat. That's not just a priest thing, that would also be true for paladins and shamans but all of this was later nerfed and combat res was given to druids. And as for inner fire, its very first form here was just a straight damage and armor increase, but all those spells and what you're seeing in front of you is the entire toolkit of the priest, so obviously very early stages here. In a previous episode, we went over Alpha Stormwind, so I figured I'd show the horde a little love here with Alpha Orgrimmar, which is pretty different. First entering the city, we have a boar trainer. If you've been watching this series, you'd know how hunters needed to train specific pet abilities from these specialized trainers, so here's where you would have gotten the boar spells for the horde. Another thing you'll notice is that the guards have a different look, but entering the city, you'll find that there's no auction house yet, the bank looks a little different, and it's harder to navigate because that little ridge that connected the flight path tower to the PvP building and the Valley of Spirit is gone now. In fact, the entire Valley of Spirit is missing in this version. It's just a long, skinny path leading to the back entrance of the city. Also, in this version, this is where you boarded the Zeppelin, which, if you remember, that was a change in the Cataclysm expansion version of the city. But, little did we know, this was actually the original. But, heading back into the main hub and past the missing auction house, that little path that led to the Valley of Honor and the Cleft of Shadow is now three levels. The Cleft of Shadow is now called the Voodoo Lounge, 
and it's also really glitchy so excuse the jarring videography here but the main difference that i can tell is that rfc isn't in yet and the entrance is replaced by a tent heading to the valley of honor you'll notice some differences in layout and texture they have this big ramp here instead of that little pond where they had the fishing trainers and the building that held the hunter trainers is different and it now holds warrior trainers and the hunter trainers are now where the warriors and battle masters were and there's also this coliseum where lore-wise Varian Rin battled, but this would have been a cool dueling arena for players. Thrall's building is quite different, now holding three different rooms and being kind of confusing to navigate. If you remember in Desolus, that burning blade fortress where you escort out the night elf, it's basically two of those buildings squashed together. And Thrall is also hot pink. But back in Stormwind, since I mentioned it, Something I missed from a previous episode are some NPC model changes, such as in the cheese shop, you have a more lightweight human. This is probably because it came from Star Wars Galaxies, which had character customization way ahead of its time. But I always thought it was kind of lame that you couldn't change your body type in the original character creation. And you still can't even to this day from what I know, aside from fat humans being a new race entirely, for whatever reason. But I always thought it would have been cool if you could have chosen between thin, fat, and mid forms to better match your class. It's like, this guy's pretty buff for a class with five strength. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Maybe it would have made it unfair because other races didn't have it. But I thought it would have been cool to be like this more stealthy, agile looking rogue. Anyways, in a previous episode, we mentioned the survivalist profession, where there would be areas in the game that were very dark that you could navigate more easily by lighting torches. Something I found in this alpha is that we do actually have one such area. The Aldaman dungeon is actually incredibly dark. Honestly, it's probably just a glitch with the lighting, but out of all the times I've seen this profession discussed, I've never actually seen a dark area in the game, so I thought it would be cool to see what it could have looked like and how difficult it would have been to navigate these dungeons without a clearly lit path. But I think that about covers it for this episode. Thank you for letting me be your tour guide once more, and I'll see you in the next episode of Cut and Weird Content that didn't make it to... Vanilla! Like the video if you liked it, because I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.